Welcome to the Ren Experience where we celebrate those making a difference in our times and inspire you to do the same. To achieve that, we have been analyzing our data and realized that 93% of our audience haven't yet subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy our content and find value, kindly do me a favor by subscribing to the channel. Your subscription helps us grow and gives us the power to bring you the guests that you want to see on the show. In keeping up with that, we'd like to thank our today's sponsors, Megatrust Inc. Megatrust Inc. is a company that empowers individuals like yourself and organizations to create an impact in their community by investing in them. Check out the website today, www.megatrustinc.com. That's www.megatrustinc.com to see how they can help you achieve your goal. Uh, it's good to finally have you on the show. Let's get started. Recently, President Joe Biden hosted African leaders at the U.S.-Africa Summit, and the event was promoted as partnership with the U.S. and Africa. And do you think this is really true that it's a partnership? Because Julius Nyerere, the, the, the first president of Tanzania, said that um, it's impossible, or how can the United States and Burkina Faso be expected to operate under the same trade laws? And he said it's like putting a heavyweight boxer in the same ring with a flyweight. And he said this will be murder. Can you give us an assessment of, of that summit and what Africa really needs to do to benefit from engagement with a power such as the U.S. or any other power? First of all, thank you for inviting me. Second of all, the December 19, 2022 summit between the United States and four dozen plus African heads of state and government was an inadequate response and a distorted response to contemporary realities. What I mean is that this summit was driven by hysteria about China. There's a lot of hysteria about China in the United States of America right now. There is a fear that China is in the passing lane and this holds monumental consequence, not only for US imperialism, but for white supremacy as well. Not only that, but there's hysteria about Russia. You should look at the reporting that took place in the United States in the past few days in light of the visit to South Africa of Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. Not to mention the overheated press reports about Russian South African military maneuvers, even though the South African military has engaged in military maneuvers with the United States of America. There's hysteria about Turkey. Uh, Turkey plays a major role in many African nations that have a substantial Muslim population. Turkey is the power behind the throne, for example, in Somalia engaged in everything from picking up the garbage to airport security. Uh, Turkey's relations with not only the United States, but with the so-called North Atlantic allies has become quite complicated uh, of late, uh, particularly since Turkey thus far has been blocking the ascension of Finland and Sweeto, uh, Finland and Sweden, to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, where Turkey plays a major role as the Eastern anchor of NATO. Uh, Turkey has upset the United States because of the pressure it has placed upon Greece. Greece, as you know, for a number of years was under the jurisdiction of Turkey. Certainly within that context, we cannot escape the religious contradictions between predominantly Christian Greece and predominantly Muslim Turkey, or Turkeya, as it calls itself nowadays. The United States is quite concerned about the role of India in Africa as well, particularly along the Indian Ocean coast from Mombasa in Kenya to Durban in South Africa, particularly Intermediate in the intermediate uh, country that is uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And this takes place despite the fact that the United States would like to woo India into an anti China alliance, which we cannot rule out altogether 
although right now it looks doubtful since India is a leading member with South Africa in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which is presenting a stern challenge to the so-called G7 or group of seven led by the United States and including the North Atlantic countries, Canada and Japan. So this summit that took place in December, 2022 in Washington, uh, over-promised and under-delivered. I recall the top line figure emerging in terms of so-called aid from that summit. It was about 55 billion US dollars. At the same time, the newly appointed Chinese foreign minister, Chen Gong, was in Ethiopia, where he unveiled a new sparkling, brand new headquarters of the African Center for Disease Control, which is good news for the health of Africans, bad news for Ebola and COVID. At the same time, Chen Gong, who was in January 2023, exemplifying a Chinese tradition of uh, touring Africa as the first assignment on his annual list, uh, he forgave $13 billion in debt for Ethiopia. So that's one country, $13 billion. United States, four dozen plus nations, $55 billion. Uh, that also bespeaks the fact that China right now is the major so-called aid donor uh, in the world. And the United States does some useful work in Africa with regard to health and health consequences. However, if you look at the light rail in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, which bids fair to relieve that congested capital of traffic slowdowns, if you look at the rail from uh, Ethiopia into uh, Djibouti, if you look at the rail from Nairobi to Mombasa, if you look throughout the African continent, uh, you see that China is involved in building important infrastructure, whereas the United States is twisting the arms of African leaders trying to get them to enlist in this new Cold War <laughs> against China and Russia. So for most uh, African nations, in fact, for most Latin American nations and most nations in the world, this does not make any sense, uh, even though the United States would like you to believe that the whole world has enlisted uh, with the United States uh, concerning this new Cold War against Russia over its intervention in Ukraine, a recent headline in this country suggested that 87% of the world had not enlisted. And of course, the question is, why should they? Suppose the United States apparently does not recognize that it has normalized war, death, and suffering in Africa. It barely garners a headline just a few days ago, you had U.S. military men on the ground in Somalia uh, killing militants. It, it barely garnered a headline. Whereas we're all supposed to be in a tizzy, terribly upset about Ukraine. I mean, that's different, supposedly. Uh, obviously, this bespeaks the naked racism and white supremacy of U.S. foreign policy, a naked racism and white supremacy that helps to explain why you have millions of US nationals of African descent whose ancestors were exploited harshly during the unlimited African slave trade, including my own ancestors, by the way. And Africa should ask the United States, why don't you do right about African-Americans before you come to Africa, uh, supposedly handing out aid and seeking favors. It seems to me that's the least that can happen. But why is the U.S. so afraid of losing its influence over Africa? Well, I think the answer is simple. 
because the United States recognizes that it became a superpower through the shameless exploitation of people of African descent. Reference the unlamented African slave trade, for example. The United States exploited the African national natural resources, be it uh, rubber in the Congo or gold in South Africa, palladium in South Africa, uranium in Namibia, oil in Angola, oil in Nigeria, natural gas in Algeria. And so there's an old saying in the United States that the people you meet on the way up, you will also meet on the way down. <laughs> there is a fear that with the United States in precipitous decline, with the rise of China, and of course, the United States helped to assist the rise of China because it was so hysterical about Russia, and I'll get into that in a second. But in any case, there's this real fear that just as Africa was essential to the rise of the United States, if Africa pulls away from the United States, that will help to be a catalytic factor in the decline of the United States. Now, let me return, as I said, to this point about the rise of China. Uh, you may recall the Cold War, this titanic conflict between Moscow and Washington, even though the United States likes to boast that the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989, was due to the ineffectiveness of socialism, I think that actually the key factor in both of those collapses was what happened approximately 50 years ago when U.S. President Richard Nixon and his foreign policy aide, Henry Kissinger, brokered an agreement with China on an anti-Moscow basis. This led to massive foreign direct investment of the United States corporations into China. And now, <laughs> with China benefiting from that relationship, the United States now wants to decouple from China, although that's going to be very difficult because if you look at corporations uh, headquartered in the United States like Apple, Microsoft, Starbucks, Tesla. Tesla, of course, uh, founded by uh, a man whose roots are in part state South Africa, speaking of Elon Musk. All of these corporations' profits are heavily tied to the Chinese market. And it's going to be very difficult to disrupt that relationship, it would be the equivalent of unscrambling the egg. It's virtually impossible. And that's one of the reasons why you had a leading US general in the last 24 to 48 hours telling his, uh, his men and his women under his command that they should pre prepare for war with China by 2025 about two years from now. And he said the way to prepare is to set up targets uh, of effigies, Chinese effigies, and, and shoot bullets through their head. That, that, was, his, that was his advice. Uh, uh, this is going to be very problematic. And African nations should recognize that after or if they sign on, to a conflict with Russia, next they'll be asked to sign on to a conflict with China. <laughs> that's that's a, a guarantee. All for the purpose of helping to preserve the fragmenting hegemony of US imperialism. And African leaders should ask themselves, why should they sacrifice blood and treasure to guarantee the hegemony of U.S. imperialism. I mean, that obviously make, makes no sense, but even repeating that nonsensical request 
it bespeaks the contempt that Washington has for Africa uh, insofar as it would expect African nations to sacrifice their own best interests to save the bacon, if you like, of U.S. imperialism. That makes no sense. It, it doesn't make any sense. And it, I think it goes forward to show how powerful the African continent is if it had seized its, uh, its, the opportunity that it had during decolonization um, to form the United States of Africa as how you know, some of their leading leaders during that time, such as Kwame Nkrumah, has urged. And well, the continent will have been able to protect its sovereignty and its resources and use them to industrialize and create a powerful nation. But unfortunately, that opportunity was missed. And are there any contemporary or future opportunities that you think can be seized and what must be done to see it through? Because even for the current, uh, well, relationships that exist and, you know, the communities such as the East African community that exist, we have recently seen the, the, the dispute between DRC and Rwanda. And it just goes forward to show how weak these institutions are and could we see another opportunity for the African continent to really unite and form the United States of Africa that would, you know, put it in the map of the world superpowers? Well, as you know, we already have an African continental free trade area. Recall that about a half century ago, the European Union did not exist. It fundamentally started with about six nations as a kind of coal and steel community and then evolved into a European economic community and then into the European Union, in which we all know today. Uh, Africa seemingly is on a similar path with the African continental free trade area, which bids fair to knock down trade barriers to tr create one market, for example. I think it's inevitable that there are going to be hiccups along the way because the analogy that you use from President Nairari a few moments ago between Burkina Faso and the United States, you could use a similar analogy between, say, South Africa and Swaziland or between Nigeria and Benin. Uh, in other words, we're talking about economies that are hardly comparable in size and power uh, seeking to unite uh, under one roof. That's, going, that's not going to be easy. Uh, but the attempt is, is being made. Certainly, the example of the African Union headquartered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, is an example of uh, Pan-African cooperation just as the regional blocks. You mentioned the East African community. Uh, you could mention the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS. Uh, you could mention the Southern African development community, uh, which includes the nations of that region, which, by the way, have stood by uh, Zimbabwe as it has come under unremitting pressure from the United States and its allies, because Zimbabwe had the audacity and temerity to engage in land reform, attempting to reverse the fruits of settler colonialism. That is to say, uh, we know that beginning in the 1890s, you had a massive invasion of that Southern African nations by British alleged conquerors who even had the nerve to rename the nation Rhodesia after the freebooter and pirate Cecil Rhodes of Great Britain. And we know that that led to a liberation war from 1965 to 1980. You can see my book on that subject and about the US role there, just as your audience may want to look at my book, White Supremacy Confronted, on the struggle of Southern Africa as a whole against U.S. imperialism. In any case, uh, independent Zimbabwe, as noted, sought to reverse the fruits of settler colonialism, which was greeted with hysteria in London and Washington, even though under the Lancaster House 
Accords that led to independence in 1980, uh, the parties had agreed that there would be this kind of land reform, but uh, London under Tony Blair, Tony Blair balked, and that led to sanctions being imposed on Zimbabwe in an effort to drive the economy into the ditch, an effort that continues. Indeed, it's quite striking, is it not, that uh, President Mnangagwa of Zimbabwe uh, did not receive an invitation to the aforementioned uh, summit, December 2022 in Washington, although I understand there was Zimbabwean representation of a sort. So once again, Africa should ask Washington, show your good intentions, not only by doing justice to your own population of African descent, but also lifting the savage sanctions against Zimbabwe, which has negative repercussions throughout the region. It hampers the economic and political integration of this region, and it makes it difficult to take steps alongst the path, alongst the road, a Pan-African unity of a sort that you suggested in your comment, as long as Zimbabwe is treated like an outlier, as long as Zimbabwe is tr treated as if it were a polecat. And what's even more curious is that a lot of people in the United States, believe it or not, despite the fact that Zimbabwe has opposition political parties, uh, has an opposition press, and despite the fact that in many African nations like Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea, just to cite two amongst many, not to mention Swaziland, which is an absolute uh, monarchy, where is the opposition press? Where is the opposition parties? Yet Zimbabwe in the United States is considered to be the gross violator of human rights and most folks in the United States could not point out Cameroon on a map, even if you showed them where Nigeria is. And so this is the kind of ignorance that allows for this sort of gross exploitation of a nation like Zimbabwe, which is not only an outrage, it's an insult to Africa. It's not only an insult and an outrage to Zimbabwe, it's an insult and outrage to the entire continent, and indeed to all of progressive humanity. When the African head of states traveled to Washington for the summit, it got me thinking. And in as much as Africa seems to have a huge influence in terms of uh, the power that the US has, it still has no power such that these heads of states traveled to Washington just to meet President Biden, right? And the fact that all of these head of states leave the continent to go and meet President Biden and discuss about US and Africa partnership, I think it goes forward to show that African countries are yet to make a step that will give them influence and power to be able to have a say in these matters. And how do you think Africa can gain that power? Well, I think Africa is en route to changing the dynamics. Part of the issue is demographics. The fact is that the rates, many of the industrialized countries are declining. The birth rates in Africa are not doing the same, particularly in countries like Nigeria. And so that means that in this century, a significant percentage of the working class will be in Africa. In fact, you have certain commentators, at least in the United States, who are suggesting that the only savior for countries like Italy uh, would be to allow more Africans to come in to work because of the falling birth rates in Italy. This population 
gives African nations a fair amount of leverage with regard to redistributing the wealth and disrupting the relationship historically between Africa and the North Atlantic nations, which historically has been with the European or Euro-American horse to the African, excuse me, European or Euro-American rider to the African horse. And you see a resistance to this growing reality, particularly in Italy, where you have a neo-fascist government under Prime Minister Maloney, uh, whose naked racism is breathtaking and startling at the same time. You see similar policies uh, arising in Sweden, for example. But I'm afraid to say that North Atlantic imperialism has helped to create this phenomenon. What I mean is, I'm sure you and your audience recall what happened in 2011 with the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime in Libya uh, at a time when Libya was moving to accelerate Pan-African unity uh, through its vast oil wealth. Uh, this stoked outrage leading to a NATO bombing campaign uh, in Libya, the murder of the leader, Mr. Gaddafi, uh, this taking place despite the protests of many African nations. Uh, once again, U.S. imperialism under then U.S. President Barack Obama uh, thumbed its nose at Africa and overthrew the Libyan regime. Chaos ensued and has ensued to this very day. There are credible reports of neo-slavery in Libya. Libya's chaos also created a situation whereby many Africans fleeing, for example, Eritrea, would make their way to Libya to try to cross the Mediterranean into Italy. Some did not succeed and drowned in the Mediterranean. Some did succeed and wound up in Italy where they were subjected to vituperation and venomous assault by the authorities. Uh, Maloney and her party, the so-called Brothers of Italy, uh, used the arrival of these Africans to whip up racist sentiment, which helped to propel her and her party to the leading position at the ballot box. Likewise, with the overthrow of Gaddafi, you saw tons of weapons leak out to neighboring countries, Mali not least, which helped to fuel uh, a so-called religious insurgency, which then caused Bamako, the authorities, to request French assistance, which was inept, impotent, and ineffective, causing Mali to ask or to demand that the French troops evacuate sooner rather than later. Raising the question of France also helps to illustrate an answer to your question because France has been a major vampire in Africa, particularly in its former colonies, Senegal, Algeria, Mali, Chad, Burkina Faso, the list is long. And indeed, the so-called CFA, the currency that's used in many of these countries is based upon resources plundered from Africa that are kept in Paris. As of now, there is conflict between the European Union, where France plays a major political role, and U.S. imperialism. However, they have a unity with regard to the exploitation of, Af of Africa. In fact, uh, France utilizes Washington's satellite assets to keep a tab on its former colonies in Africa. 
what we need to see happen is not only uh, other nations following the example of Mali when they asked that the French military advisors evacuate immediately, but there also needs to be a study by diplomats and scholars and researchers of the tensions between the European Union and the United States so that Africa can take advantage of these tensions. You, you, you see this recently with regard to Algeria. What I mean is, is that with the Ukraine crisis, the European nations have decided to boycott Russian energy, particularly natural gas. Apparently, they've been able to overcome the winter because the winter was not as bitter as it often is. It's not clear if they'll be able to escape the winter of 2023. This put a premium on Algerian natural gas to heat homes and to cook food. And so what happened is that the Algerian leadership was able to play Spain off against Italy for the benefit of the Algerians. What I'm suggesting is that Africans need to be able to play the United States off against the European Union. And there are many reasons or many pressure points. Uh, for example, when President Macron was in Washington just a few weeks ago, it was evidence, evident, despite all of the smiles and pats on the back, that there were tensions between France and the United States particularly over this recent legislation passed in Washington, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which calls for subsidies from the US government to green energy construction. Green energy meaning energy moving away from fossil fuels, moving away from diesel and petroleum. Uh, moving towards wind and solar, which of course Africa has uh, in, gr in grand amounts. And so you see the tension between Paris and Washington over that legislation, because there's a fear that European corporations will move to the United States <laughs> as opposed to uh, building their facilities in Western Europe. Uh, at the same time, you see uh, unremitting tensions between Boeing, the airplane manufacturer of the United States, and Airbus, the European competitor. And there's all sorts of tensions and conflicts between Europe and the United States. And it's up to researchers and diplomats and scholars and journalists and Africa to bring this to a wider audience so that the leadership can work out a strategy to take advantage of these tensions and contradictions. And certainly that means in the first instance, uh, not falling for the trap of heeding US demands that African leaders sign on to the sanctions crusade against Russia or the new Cold War against China. Also uh, give a further bit of advice to African intellectuals and leaders, which is that you really need to talk to these black American intellectuals and leaders because I'm not sure if they're aware of what's going on in the world, which is quite shocking. Because if, if there's any place where you ought to be able to keep up with what's going on in the world is the United States because of internet access and because of uh, the ability to be in touch with anybody on planet Earth within a nanosecond. But you would not know this if you were to look at the legislation introduced by Black American political leader Gregory Meeks of New York in the US Congress, 
which calls upon the United States to impose sanctions on African nations that refuse to go along with the U.S. policy in Russia. Now, you would think that Black American leaders would be so upset by what has befallen the Black American community, the latest scandal being a videotape from Memphis, Tennessee, of a young Black man being murdered on camera, which is not unusual. That happens quite frequently. You would think that these Black American political leaders, in terms, instead of pressuring Africa to go along with Washington against Russia, that they would be trying to rally the international community to do something about what's happening to Black people in the United States. But apparently, that simple idea has escaped their attention, or I should say their inattention. And that's why add, I would like to add to my list of requests to those in Africa that you talk to these Black American leaders and intellectuals and tell them you folks need to realize that there's an entire world out here. I mean, the world does not begin and end with North America, which is seemingly their point of view. Have you have you followed um, have you been following stories about the late Magufuli, president of Tanzania? Yeah, the bulldozer. I'm familiar with him and his successor. I understand that the opposition leader just has jetted in from I think Brussels, yeah. for example. Yeah, he has. I understand that uh, he died under rather suspicious circumstances. The you can confirm this. The U.S. press reported that uh, he was in denial about COVID-19 and somehow he got infected and died. Is that accurate? That's the story, but do I believe it? Absolutely not. What do you believe? I think he was assassinated. Really? I think so. I really do think so. I mean, because, well, he was the guy who, um, well, challenged the West, right? Said no to most of the requests. Um, well, canceled all the loans that were given to Tanzania. Didn't want to take any loans. Um, and yeah, I mean, he did a lot of things that upset the big guy. So, I I do believe that he was he was assassinated. What do you think of his successor? It's it's quite challenging because it seemed like they had totally different point of views and policies. And, uh, well, it's not something we would have expected at all. Mm-hmm. Well, she's been quite busy lately. Uh, she seems to uh, be on an airplane quite a bit. She has different policies, and her ways of, uh, of governing are different from the late, late Bagufuli, which we didn't quite expect to be that way. Um, and... It's just so different, right? For example, the policies around loans and foreign investment and import and export, they are very different policies. And, um, well, I think we needed Magufuli for a few more years. But here's the question, though. When we have leaders such as President Magufuli, how long do they have before they exit? Well, I think it depends. I mean... Um, obviously, the, in, in part, that's a security question. I mean, look at Cuba. Cuba is 90 miles from Florida. The founding father of the revolution, Fidel Castro, <laughs> he, he lived until, until his 90s. So, you know, it, it's not inevitable that he, any leader who runs afoul of imperialism will make an early exit. Uh, history does not bear that out. That is true. When when will the next batch of leaders such as, you know, the Sankaras or the Kwame Nkrumah and Julius, Julius Nyerere, um, when, when should we expect to have such leaders, right? The Lumumbas, because well, these are leaders who had created so much change, but then they didn't have too much time to leave, right? And... <laughs> 
what will shape the next generation of African leaders? Well, it's not only a question of individuals, it's a question of masses and classes. That is to say that if you look at the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in early 1961, the working class ideologically was not very well developed. On the other hand, you had an international situation that was more promising, perhaps, than it had been for some time, uh, insofar as he had the assistance of Nkrumah and Nkrumah backed by the socialist camp. And so, as a matter of fact, my own opinion is that rather than asking where is the next Nareri or Sankara or Lumumba, we should be thinking and asking uh, where is working class ideology? Where is working class political organization? Where is uh, intellectual awareness of the global correlation of forces? Where is militancy, anti-imperialist militancy in the first instance? Where is international solidarity, for example? Because if you have all of those, then inevitably, uh, leaders will emerge. It's, it's, it's not as if these leaders can emerge just because they happen to be brilliant. <laughs> I mean, as the saying goes, the cemeteries are full of brilliant individuals. Is there hope for Africa in spite of, of the contemporary challenges? Of course there is. Where should the young people well, look at? I mean, listen to what I've said for the past 40 minutes, for example in terms of the changing correlation of forces. As a matter of fact, if you think that there's no hope for Africa, well then, you know, you probably shouldn't be involved in politics. <laughs> you, you maybe want to go to the beach and smoke ganja, for example. <laughs> you know, if, if there's no hope, I mean, that that's, that, that, that's not, that's not a revolutionary way of looking at the world. As a matter of fact, that's what imperialism wants you to think, because then you will be demobilized and destabilized and ineffective and ineffectual. What role should Africa's youth play in Africa's development? Well, first of all, they need to be organized. Um, one of the things in socialist countries is that traditionally they have youth who are organized. For example, there, there's usually three levels of organization. There's the political party, which is led by a political bureau and a central committee. There is a youth wing of that political party that incorporates people from about 18 to 40. And then there are the young pioneers uh, from about the age of nine to 18. And they all work in sync and they all work together. So if you don't have organization and you think you're going to confront imperialism, well, you probably smoke too much ganja, for example, because that's a fantasy. It's, it's not going to happen. That's a fantasy. It's not going to happen. How how has colonialism and racism shaped the minds of Africa's young people, right, into either the superiority or the inferiority complex? Well, you're, you, you're in Africa. You, you can probably answer that question more effectively than myself. But how can we go about that? Because we are still living the effects of it today. How so? Well, first of all, um, you know, judging people on, on, on the basis of their skin. And, and here's the interesting part. It happens subconsciously, even if you don't think about it. You just happen to behave that way. Like you have different perceptions of people based on how they look. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a product of underdevelopment. I mean, it, it, first of all, you need to realize it's not inevitable. It, 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 it arose for certain reasons. It'll decline for certain reasons. And it won't decline unless there's organization. I mean, 
organization, not only in terms of that tripart organization that I outlined of the, the party, the youth wing of the party and the young pioneers, but also publishing, having publications, a social media presence with regard to uh, social media, a television presence, radio presence. I mean, this is not that complicated. I mean, it's just a matter of the will and the resources and the consciousness. Now, if you don't have the consciousness, nor the will, nor the resources, well, sure, anything is bound to happen. I mean, if you have more young people who want to become conscious and um, intellectuals, then we have high chances of Africa, you know, becoming an eco having economic power because unless we have economic power, then everyone is going to try messing up with us. Well, not necessarily. It depends on the alliances, for example. Oh. Uh, and that's why it was so heartening to see that Africa has not joined the crusade against Russia. That's why it's so heartening to return full circle that Africa was not taken in by the December 2022 summit in Washington, D.C. That African leaders, I think, recognize that they're being courted. You notice that Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, was in Senegal, Zambia, and South Africa over the past few days. Uh, Mr. Biden is planning to come to Africa either this year or next. So I'm, I'm not, you know, we're, we're winding down, so I'm not sure what else I can tell you. So last question before we close off, Professor Horn. China has provided an alternative for African countries, but in the long run, should Africa be worried about the investment that China is making into the continent? Well, in the long run, we're all dead. So <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by the long run. I, I think that at least there will be the legacy of a light rail system in Lagos, Nigeria. At least there will be the Chinese legacy of a new headquarters of the Center for Disease Control in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. At least part of the Chinese legacy will be a rail system from Mombasa to Nairobi. Now, we leave it up to the leaders and the political parties and civil society and the journalists to make sure that the terms that led to this infrastructure are beneficial for Africa. Of course, you need to ignore the propaganda coming from Washington because no matter what the terms, even if it's an outright gift, Washington will say it represents exploitation. Even if, even if China comes with a Center for Disease Control and says, here, take it. You know, no conditions. Washington will say, ah, you know, it's exploitation. It's a trap. So you have to ignore that propaganda. And the best situation is for Africa through its embassies to maintain positive relations around the world uh, with Brazil for example, which under his new leader, Lula da Silva, will have a very energetic Africa policy. And it's up to African leaders, political parties, civil society, journalists to take advantage of that. In any case, thank you for your time. Absolutely, Professor Hon. Thank you very much.